hippies, welcome to another episode of the Sensible Hippie Podcast, and I'm your host, the Sensible Hippie. Today, we're stepping into a world shrouded in mystery and antiquity with our special guest, Doug Van Dorn. Doug is a pastor, a renowned author, and he has delved deep into the lesser explored corners of biblical narratives, shining a light on the Nephilims and other mysterious figures from the scriptures. His unique combination of scholarly insight and pastoral experience brings new perspectives to the Bible's most complex and intriguing aspects. And as we unfold the secrets hidden in ancient text and explore interpretations beyond the conventional, I invite you to immerse yourself in this enlightening conversation. And don't forget, if you've loved our journey into the unknown so far, I ask if you could please leave me a positive review on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, Rumble, or whatever your favorite podcast platform is. It would mean the world to me. It would help grow this podcast and this community. So thank you very much. So without further ado, let's dive into this conversation with Doug Van Dorn. Are you in Maui? No, I'm on Oahu. Oh, you're on Oahu. Okay. Yeah. I've been to Oahu twice, I guess. Oh, yeah? How long ago? 1983 and 1994. Oh, wow. It's changed a lot since then. Yeah, I'm sure it has. (laughs) Yes, it has. Well, thank you. Thank you again for coming on. Um, I've been reading your book, um, Giants, Son of the Gods. It's amazing. I am going down so many rabbit holes. <laughs> I can't, I, I, I've been skimming now because I have been going down so many rabbit holes. You have a quote right there at the front that, that quotes part of Genesis 6, 4. Um, it says, there were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, I think it was obvious and simple the way you wrote that. And I was thinking, yeah. You're right. There was giants before and after. And I'm assuming you're talking about after Noah's flood. Yeah, after the flood, right. The book, I think you talk a lot about that. You go in depth just in that scripture. Yeah, for sure. I spend uh, yeah, I spend a whole lot of the very beginning of the book, kind of the introduction, talking about all these reasons why the, why, um, the giants are actual giants and that their fathers are fallen angels and and uh, that kind of stuff. So, you know, in my circles, there's there's a whole disagreement about that passage that that uh, who are the sons of God? Are they are they humans? Or are they fallen angels? And the main interpretation for a thousand years has been humans, but the first interpretation of it was not that at all. It was fallen angels. So, uh, yeah, I spent a lot of time talking about that text. Yeah, I know you went really deep down that. Um, has that verse influenced your views on angels and demons in different cultures at all? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, once you, once you come to the grips with there's fact that there are fallen angels that did something before the flood and then right there, so they're at, they're after the flood too. And my view of that is that, that there was probably another incursion of angels. So the, you know, the story goes that that the first group of angels was locked up into the depths of hell, basically. Um, but there seems to have been another group of them that did something similar, probably at the Tower of Babel. And so if that's the case, then Tower of Babel, what happens to the nations? They get dispersed all over the earth. And these heavenly beings, these watchers, these sons of God, gods, whatever you want to call them, they, uh, they went with the nation so that they ended up ruling over them. So this is, uh, yeah, this is something that takes place then all over the, all over the entire, the entire surface of the globe. So these stories that you hear from all the different myths, yeah, I don't know, maybe you hear some of these even in Hawaii with some of the native people there and, you know, I don't know, but if you do, this is where the origin of that comes from. That makes so much sense. I never thought about that. You're right. With that tower of Babel. So they were trying to, I think you mentioned that they were trying to communicate with 
the angels, I guess, maybe the fallen angels and try to contact them or I'm, I'm not really quite sure. Um, but it wasn't that they were trying to reach God, but they were trying to maybe communicate. Yeah. Well, I mean, we take that. I think a lot of people take the tower battle thing um, physically so that they build a really high towers if they actually think that if they get enough bricks, they can actually climb up to heaven or something. I mean, that that kind of an idea is just nonsensical. I mean, we have we have buildings that are half a mile in the sky and and it's very obvious that those things aren't going to reach up to heaven. So it has to be something else going on. And, you know, that that even the origins of the Tower of Babel go back to at least the Garden of Eden, believe it or not, where the Garden of Eden is called a it's called a mountain in the book of Ezekiel. And this is the place where there's a cherubim who's been placed on the top of it. And and he's walking around in the midst of these stones of fire, which seem to be heavenly beings and and there's this whole weird scene of heavenly beings there present with human beings, Adam and Eve. And so, like, this is the reason why Adam and Eve are tempted by the serpent, because it's a place where he belonged. They call it the divine council. And uh, so the Tower of Babel is really, it's a recreation of this mountain of Eden. But instead of it being God's creation, this is their creation. Instead of God coming down to Adam, this is man going up and it's not going up to God. It's going up to the gods. It's going up to the fallen angels and, and uh, trying to worship them. So they're trying to contact, they're trying to, I'm guessing that they probably are trying to do something similar to whatever happened before the flood that we're not really told a lot about how it happened. So if you go back to the book of Enoch, we know that the tradition tells us that that these 200 watchers came down on the summit of Mount Hermon, which is the biggest mountain in Israel, uh, 9,000 feet. It's a lot like your mountains in Hawaii, actually. Like Colorado's mountains are kind of like that, but your ears are these sprawling things that start from the ocean and go up, you know, on the big island, they go up to 14, almost 14,000 feet. But that's a lot like the way Mount Hermon is. It's just this huge place. And it's in this really weird spot on the earth with, the latitude being 33rd degrees and, and all this weird stuff. And, and so they came down on this mountain, saw our women, and then, you know, the whole thing happened. So you've got these three episodes that are all taking place on a mountain. You've got Eden, you've got uh, the watchers coming down, and then you have the Tower of Babel, which is a man-made mountain. It's, a, it's basically our attempts at religion to try and make it all happen again, I guess, if you want to think of it like that. Wow, I never thought of that. That's really interesting. Um, you also you mentioned about how Mount Hermon connects to this theme of devoting and destruction, um, especially in relation with the story of Nephilim. What, right. do you, what do you mean by that? Yeah. Yeah. So um, the word the word for Hermon, um, it's got these letters an H and an R and an M. And the word for, um, if you go in and read like uh, late in books of Moses, early in Joshua, we'll talk about going in and doing some, some translations call it the ban and others uh, you need to devote to destruction. And then it will tell you, you know, devote an entire city, divide, devote the men and the women, the children, the animals, don't even take the plunder, you know, leave it all alone, kill them all. So that the word in Hebrew for that is very, very similar to the HRM. It's got a basically a KHRM root. And so there's a connection going on here between Hermon, which is a mountain that can mean like the curse, and then this idea of going into the land and killing these creatures that that are on the earth after the flood that came from uh that came their origins are with these watchers. Okay, so they came down on Mount Hermon, and then you're going to destroy the the children of Mount Hermon, basically. So there's it's a, it's kind of a wordplay that's taking place there, but that's the reason, you know. A lot of people get really mad at the God of the Old Testament; he's so mean, and and all he wants to do is kill everybody. Well, that's totally not true. He, he has a very specific group of people in mind that he needs to wipe out because these people are totally evil. And they've tried to destroy his plan to bring about salvation to the earth. And so it's not like God is going in and having Israel kill everybody who's around them. It's a very specific targeted group of people 
if you don't understand the Genesis six story, it doesn't make any sense. But once you do, all of a sudden, you know, this evil, horrible God starts to make a lot more sense. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I believe um, you in your book with um, with Noah, you broke down, I guess, a lot of the different ways of thinking of other people's thinking of how this incursion maybe came about again. Um, some thinks it was from uh, maybe the wives of Noah's um you know, that bloodline, maybe something right. like that. And you right. broke down in different ways, which I thought was very intriguing. I didn't know that there was such a controversy on that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it doesn't tell us, right? So you kind right. of have to guess. And so you have to figure out, well, what what are the possible logical options that it could be? And, you know, I've kind of narrowed it down to about four of them. One is that, uh, and, and a couple of them I think are kind of ridiculous. A couple of them I think are have a better shot at being true, but... <laughs> You know, the, the most silly one is probably the one that the Jews always told their little children as a fairy tale before they go to bed is that King Og, who's the giant Moses' day, hitched a ride on Noah's Ark and lived as Noah fed him through a hole in the roof and stuff like that. Like, <laughs> I don't think so. Probably not. And then uh, you, know, you have others that that maybe somebody on the Ark had the bloodline. I actually don't think that that one probably works because it kind of seems to defeat the whole point of why God would start over with this family if they're unblemished. Uh, so that gives you really two other options. One is that maybe the flood wasn't a, a worldwide flood. And so maybe, maybe it didn't reach everywhere. I tend to think it was a worldwide flood, but maybe it's possible that they hid underground in caves or something like that. And that one to me is maybe more plausible. And then the one that I actually think makes the most sense is that there was another fall of angels or whatever at the Tower of Babel. And so God punished us because they were trying to do the same thing they did before the flood. And it made so God met God so mad the first time that he destroyed the whole earth. So he's like, I'm not going to let you get away with doing this. I'm going to scatter you around the world, make it so you can't understand each other. Yeah. Well, he never breaks his promise. I mean, after the flood, he did gave gave us the sign of the rainbow, and he said he would never destroy the earth again exactly. by flood. Yeah. So I guess with that promise, I guess he just scattered people. Yeah, instead. he goes about it a different way. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> incredible. Wow. Um, what does Mount Hermon symbolizes uh, symbolize in the broader sense context? I guess in the Old Testament. Um, Genesis 6, 4, and the narrative of the, the Nephilim, I think Mount Hermon is, symbolizes, I, I'm not sure, but it's very important for the people. I'm not sure if it's because of the Nephilims that are trying to come, to come down, but it's, it's significant Mount Hermon is in the Bible. It's, yeah, it's, I, mean, I mean, yeah, go ahead. No, I was going to say, and is, isn't the, um, um, there's that council up there, the, the, oh my god, The gosh. divine council, right. And yeah, so they all, so Mount Hermon is very significant to the Bible and to the giants. Yeah, is I mean, this is the place, this is the place where the, the, so a giant is, a Nephilim is not a fallen angel, the, the a Nephilim is the children of the fallen angels, okay? So they're, they're different, but it's on Mount Hermon. Mm -hmm. There's, I mean, there's different reasons why we might think that they chose Mount Hermon. I think the location on the earth itself mm -hmm. is really significant for that, but I don't really go into that in the book, but um, the fact that it's in the land of Canaan, I think that's pretty important. The fact, the fact that they call that place Bashan, which is the place of the serpent. Uh, it's just, it, it became known as this uh, mountain really of evil. It's where the, the kind of the first evil after the, after the fall took place. It's the epicenter for all this stuff on, on the planet. And so, yeah, Herman becomes this uh, anti-mountain, I guess, if you want to call it that, that all the places where God comes down, you know, Mount Sinai, um, the Mount when Jesus is on the Sermon on the Mount, giving the law or Mount, um, the Mount of his death at Calvary, um, all these different mountains where Jesus, God is at, they're kind of like they're at war, they're fighting Mount Hermon and, and God's end up going to actually think God will end up taking back Mount Hermon for good at the end of time. But 
I don't know that that's happened yet. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't the UN on there too? Oh yeah, the, on... I think it's the highest UN base in the whole world is on Mount Hermon, which is <laughs> just so odd, freaky, very freaky. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think you even wrote um, in your in your book you wrote about a time and a place of the giant's arrival, and that there was a rock that was found on Mount Hermon. Yeah, and. And, a, and it, I think it said, according to the command of the greatest and the holy God, those who take an oath proceed proceed it from here. That's such a weird thing to say and to find on that mountain. Top of a mountain. So, yeah, yeah it goes back to, um, so that, that that rock is written in Greek. And they I think that they predate it. So before the New Testament. You can't quite tell because it's written in stone, so you don't know exactly when, but most likely predates. There was an ancient temple, so it's not just the UN, like the highest temple ever known in the, in the old world was on Mount Hermon, right very close to this giant rock that they found up there with that inscription on it. And the thing about the inscription is that it's basically telling you the exact same story that you read about in the book of Enoch, that, that when the angels came down, they said, we're going to take an oath, we're going to promise we're going to do this and cursed be any of you if you don't follow through with it. And so then there's a rock that they find on top of this mountain that says the exact same thing. And nobody's ever heard of this thing. So my, my buddy Derek Gilbert and his wife found that one for me. And I and so I had to add it to the new edition of the book. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I didn't know about that either. That is incredible. That is incredible. I think um, you even mentioned about... Um, um, I forget his name now. Um, in South Africa, they had found all these bones. Actually, they I guess they're kind of like petrified hearts, yeah, kidneys, yeah. knuckles of the giant. Yeah, that's a weird right? thing. I don't know what to. I don't Tellinger. know what to make of that. D yeah, <laughs> it, tell yeah. What's his name? Uh, Michael Michael, Te Tell Michael, Tell Michael Tell Tellinger. Yes. Yeah, that's yes. right. He's the guy who um. So there's this footprint in South Africa, not too far from where he lives. It's on the side of a side of a rock. This thing, have you seen that? It's I gigantic. Saw that of your it's, book. Got, it's got six toes in it, and it's really weird. It's like this half the size of a human, just a foot. And I, I mean, if that's not a foot, I don't know what is. I mean, it's really weird. So this guy telling her thinks that he he thinks that all these rocks that people mistake as rocks that are all over strewn all over South Africa are actually these petrified bones and he hits them with a, he, I forget what he hits them exactly with, but they ring like they're hollow. And yeah, I don't, I don't know what to make about that. Is it, is that, is he right? I mean, maybe I'm these days I'm open for just about anything. So. <laughs> I wonder if you can do DNA test on that. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that would be interesting. Well, what led you to explore this topic of, of giants? How did you come across doing this? Is this not a easy topic that people talk about? No, they don't. It's a, I mean, it's a, it's become a really fun one, but now it was, yes. it was really, I wasn't even looking for it. You know, I'm a pastor <laughs> been mm -hmm. preaching. I preach the books of the Bible and I do my studies on a lot of my study comes from just Google searches and looking for <laughs> journal articles and stuff like that. Peer reviewed stuff that people have written. And I came across an article that really had nothing to do with what I was preaching at the time, but I was so interested in it that I read the whole thing and I was like, wow, that's wow. I don't even know what to do with that. And it wasn't on giants, but it was on the, it was basically on the watchers, the, the, the sons of God. So a few months later, I'm searching around doing some more work, same book. I think it was an Exodus. And then I, I came across another article and it sounded just like this one from this, this other guy. And I, I thought, well, it couldn't be the same guy. And it turns out it was the same guy, same exact guy. And so I looked him up and I said, I got to find out more about this dude. And so he turns out he's a, he was a, he was a professor, uh, taught for a little while in Wisconsin, got his PhD in old Testament languages. And then he had taken a job at Logos Bible software. And so he was like an evangelical Christian. And so I thought, well, I got to find out more about him. And he had a website. He he went to um, Roswell UFO conferences and, and did biblical theology for these people. And like, this guy's like, this guy's right up my alley. He'd done coast to coast <laughs> AM and stuff like that. His name was uh, Michael Heiser. 
Oh, and yes. then he, yeah, he ended up writing, uh, you know, this book called the unseen realm. But back in those days, he had a, he was giving out a, a version of it for free to the people on his website. If they would give him, you know, comments and stuff back. So I read that that's where I came across the giants was from that book. And he talked about it in maybe two or three chapters, maybe four, but it wasn't the focus of his book, but I was so interested in the topic and I had nobody to talk to. Nobody knew who he was. And, you know, nobody was thinking about giants in my circles. So the only way that I could really uh, work it out in my head was to start writing. And so eventually what came out was the book and it was just mostly just, I didn't write it to write it. I wrote it because I was trying to understand what he was talking about. <laughs> and then when I got done, I said, I, I wonder if I can maybe sell this book and make a little money. <laughs> so that's that's well, the short story of it. <laughs> wow. That's incredible. I think, um, I think in the beginning you had said something about the, the giants and how your whole, I guess your whole life from that point on kind of started with this giant. I mean, from that point you became known. People were talking to you. You were going on yeah. podcast. It's amazing. Yep. This, yeah, it's this, funny. Yeah. I never in a million years would have thought that <laughs> writing this book would have, you know, taken my life in the direction that it's taken, but it has. So I guess that's so God, what God would have for me. Yeah. That's amazing. And you've met Michael Hauser. And yeah, has I, yeah, I was, I got to be friends with him. So yeah. I was trying to figure out how to, uh, how to teach this to other people. So I came up with what's, uh, what they call a catechism and so a catechism is basically just a question and answer and you you just ask a question you give an answer you ask another question you give an answer and it's got a logical flow to it and i wrote it kind of for kids but also kind of for adults and when i d was done with it somebody said well you should send it to heiser and see if he'll he'll like give you a blurb and you could publish it or something but he liked it so much that he ended up he ended up publishing it as a companion volume to his unseen realm so we became friends when we did that we ended up uh we ended up doing a podcast together called paranormal we did like 20 episodes and and we had a couple other people that were part of that and then uh he got really sick i think it was maybe two or three years ago and then passed away uh a year ago this month so pretty tough it's a big loss to the to the world especially in these in these circles so i, ca I considered him a, a friend for sure yeah yeah Amazing. I'm sure you told him the story about how you bumped into his work. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's really cool. Um, I think with the different, the different stories around the world with the giants and even the dragon um, mentioned in the Bible, the myths behind it and the stories in the different cultures around the world is very similar to the Bible and, and a lot of the stories of the Bible. Yeah. The West, though, I think they make the dragons out to be like the bad thing. And, and on the East side, like in Japan, I'm, my mother's from Japan, they revere the dragons as something to, as a protector. Uh -huh. As a yeah, wh why is that different with the East and the West? I mean, completely different. They're not oh, feared a, in 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 Japan or in China. It's it's a that's protector. a really good question. Um, I mean, so I'm kind of spitballing here. I don't know that I can give you a great <laughs> answer, but what what I tend to think is that the dragon concept, um. So it became appropriated by Christianity for Satan. So you see that in the in the mm -hmm. book of Revelation, you know, it's directly one to one. And then throughout the Old Testament, uh, you have the dragon who is uh, he becomes this foe. So he becomes um, he becomes a metaphor of like Egypt when Egypt took Israel into the captivity. And then when God uh, takes them out, he defeats the dragon. OK, so. And then you have a supernatural entity that's behind that, which, you know, is Satan himself. So that that becomes that part of it. But there's also another side of the dragon, which sometimes God himself is likened to a dragon. And you find this, especially in the Psalms, where like he's breathing fire out of his nostrils. And it's so it's not necessarily a bad image. And the dragon idea also is connected to the stars 
and to the way that the earth rotates and revolves and to the Milky Way galaxy. Um, you know that when you, when you look at the Milky Way galaxy it, at the brightest part of it, it's what they call galactic center. And it looks like a dragon. It looks like a serpent eating its tail. It's called an Ouroboros. Well, that was viewed in ancient days as the dragon. And then you have the Draco constellation in the far north that, that they believed, at least in some circles, that this was kind of responsible for keeping order together between heaven and earth. So it depends on it depends on the way that you're thinking about your you know you're you're thinking about it. You could think about it as this is like the, the the pinnacle of God's creation. It was good. It was the way he set order in place, but you can also think about it as something went terribly wrong and there were entities that were involved with that going wrong and then they become uh you know connected to the dragon. So that I mean that that's the best I can figure of why sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad because it is sometimes it's good in the Bible and sometimes it's bad. Most of the time it's bad in the Bible. And <laughs> that, I mean, that's why it becomes bad in the West, I suppose. Yeah. They kind of focus on that. Yeah. So, that's I mean, really you're, so you're in, you're in Hawaii. Yes. Do you have Hawaiian blood or is it just, is it Japanese? What else is, do you have in you? I have a lot, but Japanese is, is my mom's side. She's from Japan. So half is Japanese, and my dad has a lot of the other mix, which he's he's, he's from New Jersey. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> so all of that mix. But you're living yes. in a place that is like, it's like a melting pot between East and yes. West, right? Yep. So do you yes. have a lot of, um, do, are you familiar with Hawaiian myths that talk about mm -hmm. this kind of stuff? Yeah, uh, some of the stuff. Yeah, I don't really know a lot of the myths, but yes, I've heard of them. Yes, of course. I grew up here. Born so, and raised? I was born in Japan and raised in Hawaii. Oh, wow. Yeah. So um, I lived in the mainland for a long time, but always come back. This is home. So I always come back home. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it is a definitely a melting pot, but mostly Asian people here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and a lot of uh, mix of Asians and with um, with others, but but yeah, especially when I was growing up, it was mostly Asian and not not much mixed with whites yet. We call it hapa here is mix. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. What about what about where you are? Is there a lot of melting pot that where you are? No, not not quite. Uh, well, more, I suppose more so. It wouldn't be melting like uh, ethnicities. <laughs> it's more melting with Californians coming to Colorado because oh, <laughs> they, they've ruined their state, so they want to come and ruin my yes. state. No, <laughs> oh, no, yes, I know. I hear, I hear that. Yes, but your state is like a purple state, isn't it? It's becoming well, a purple state. Yeah, you know, 20 years ago, it was the reddest state in the union. And then there, there's actually a documentary that was put out maybe 12 years ago now um, talking about how there was, they called it the Rocky Mountain heist. And there was three billionaire leftists that came and spent three quarters of a billion dollars on the state to turn it, um, to turn it, uh, you know, left. And they worked very well and they were able to corrupt the system and it's been pretty bad, but I, I like to think that most of the people still here are pretty conservative folks, but the the power system itself is not conservative and they've been able to use it in some pretty bad ways. Wow. And Hawaii's always been yeah. a blue state. Always. Yeah, it has been. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know why, but yeah, always have been. And we, we have so much homelessness here. It's terrible. The drugs that come here and the homelessness, it's really bad. And it's been more so like when I was growing up, there was probably only maybe three homeless people that we could we remember. Me and all uh -huh. of my friends, we remember these handful of homeless people. <laughs> right. And now, I mean, there's just villages and villages, literally like a little like tent cities all over the place. Yeah, that's so what bad. they're doing to so many of our cities. I mean, Denver has it. Denver never had that 10 years ago. And now it's all over the place. You know, San Francisco, L.A., Houston, you name it. They're doing these to all these cities. So you're not alone, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I agree. I know. Um, the dragon is after our cities. <laughs> yes, that's true. <laughs> Have you ever gone to Asia? You've been everywhere. Well, I've been right? to Nepal. That's the closest that I've been. <laughs> OK, 
okay. <laughs> you know, you haven't <laughs> gone to the Asian culture or the country per I se. Haven't. No, I haven't. Oh, it's cool. Japan is awesome. Japan I would love is... to go. It would it would be so much fun to go over there. Yes, the 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 old mix with the new is amazing how they do that there. How they mix with the modern and but yet the old so you see the old temples but yet the modern building and the modern structure is really it's really cool. Yeah. Right. So hopefully we'll get to go back soon. Um I haven't been there probably 5 years now, 6 years. Okay. So, and it's changed a lot. Plus, COVID hit, so everything kind of just right. stopped. Exactly. And the the economy got so bad there. But it's good for Americans because our dollar is so strong there right now. Mm. So, now is a good time to go. <laughs> 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 um, also, in your book, um, you know, that's another thing. Japan, they have a lot of onis or a lot of giants and a lot of... Right. Yeah. Yeah. So weird. And they yeah. all lived up in a mountain. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I remember it's, it's been a long time since I looked into the Oni stuff. And, and uh, yeah. like it was a, yeah, it, a giant, a, a, a different race. It was a different race than the than the Japanese people too, from what I remember. You know, so it's like the, there was this dispersion of giants that took place. You know, I don't know if it started in Israel or not, but it went out. I, we know that it went out from Israel and we know that it went, up to the north and the west so it went up into turkey and then it went into france and germany then it went into britain and then went went into ireland and then it went over to north america but it makes you think that there probably was another migration that probably went the other direction and somehow they ended up on on i think that those guys were mostly in the northern part of japan but it like i said That's it's been a long time since i looked into that yeah yeah, I, I think, it, yeah, um, I'm from Hokkaido, which is the northern, northern part. It's a okay. separate island. Um, and I think that's considered newer part of Japan, so to speak, I guess, civilization-wise. Uh -huh. They had um, what's called Ainu people there, which is the native, the native people there. But on the main island, um, that's where I think a lot of the, the uh, stories of the giants were which they were either they were always depicted as red or blue it's kind of strange right. <laughs> the drawings right. are red right. and blue i don't know why <laughs> but um and there i know that people were afraid of them um and yeah there's a lot of stories that goes around the giants it's incredible that it's yeah they're all over the those stories are all over yeah. the world you know the same thing with the flood i, I like to tell this to people who yeah. use the flood as an argument they'll, they'll go well look the flood was all we know the flood is real because all the world had a myth of the flood. There's like 400 different myths of the flood around the world. So how can you dismiss that? And then some of these same people turn around and say, giants are ridiculous. And I say, well, it's, you just told me that all these myths prove that there was a flood and all these same cultures have giant stories. Like almost every single one of these same, same cultures do. So why is it that you take one group of stories and say that's true, but then that same people telling a different story that's related to it, you're like, no, nah, that can't <laughs> possibly be real. <laughs> uh, but it's, I mean, your book says it right there, right in the beginning, Genesis 6, 4. They were giants on the earth in those days and also after that. It's it's kind of quite simple <laughs> and yeah, point yep. blank. It, you, pretty, you pretty much. Yeah. And I never seen it that way, probably because I don't know why, but I read that in the front there, that short, tiny scripture. I'm like, wow, why is there such a big argument over this? It's, it says it right there in the Bible. It's yeah, incredible. Yeah, it sure does. Yeah. Um, and I heard, oh, what is the wheel of the giants? I, I heard you kind of talking oh, okay. about that. What is that? Yeah, so this is a monument that is in... If you go to the northern part of Israel, uh, where the the um, Sea of Galilee is, and you go about ten miles to the east of it, to the ten miles to the northern of the northern t rim of the sea, to the east of it, and literally, I kid you not, it's exactly due south of the main summit of Mount Hermon. I forget <laughs> twenty twenty five miles or something. They built in the middle of absolute nowhere a gigantic megalithic circle that looks like kind of a wheel it's got it's got um it's got 
kind of circles within circles, but it's got walls on it. So you can't quite walk around without walking into a wall. So it's kind of weird. It's, it's weird. And they didn't really discover it in modern times until the 1960s with an aerial survey that they were doing over the Golan Heights. So they called it the wheel of giants because they, they, um, they know that the giant Og lived in this area. That's probably the main reason why. And they kind of associate with him. It, it's very, very, very old. One of the oldest um, things in the country of Israel. And Israel already has a lot of really old things in it. But this thing predates Abraham. It's really, really old. And so, yeah, they, they discovered that. And there's been quite a bit of work done on it. They found a central tumulus or a, what could have been a grave. But it was empty when they, when they excavated it. I've been inside of there several times and it's, it's really weird, kind of creepy and, and, uh, it's a fun place. Wow. I very, saw very, that very photo. pagan, very pagan. Oh yeah. I saw the photos of that in your, in your book. Um, yeah, that is really weird. I think with the aerial now with drones and things like that, right. I think we can probably see a lot of things that we missed before. Yeah. You can see some really good drone footage of the wheel. Um, on YouTube. Yeah, there's a, so there's a ridge that's just a 10th of a mile north of it. It's about a mile long. It's about 20 feet high and it's fairly uniform in its width. Uh, g goes up to 300 feet wide. I mean, this thing is absolutely ginormous and it's right there above the wheel. And the peoples that live there built all kinds of burial tombs on top of this ridge, but they didn't build any in the land below it. So that was very definitely viewed as some sort of a sacred thing. And when you look at it from Google Earth, it looks exactly like a serpent. And the weirdest part of that is that, first of all, those watchers that came down on Mount Hermon are described as serpentine beings. And this is why Satan is called the serpent and the dragon. So that's another dragon little connection. <laughs> But the, the land itself was called Bashan, and Bashan is called the place of the serpent. So it's like, why would you have this mile-long effigy mound with a really strange wheel that are clearly ceremonial in nature in the land of the serpent? Well, why would that, that be? I don't think it's a coincidence at all. I think that I think that this area was kind of like we said earlier, the ground zero for a lot of really bad stuff on this earth. You think that's where the Garden of Eden was around that area? So there's actually stories that the early church had that put the Garden of Eden on Mount Hermon. I don't think that that's true. I think that that's kind of appropriating something for your own cultural context. The people who tell that story are, are of course, Syrians who live right there. <laughs> so I think probably the Garden of Eden was maybe more likely up in Iraq, Iran, <laughs> Turkey sort of area. Yeah. But we don't know. We don't know, unfortunately. Um I know your book, you, you really go into the, the names and how that's really important with um, um, like the Canaan and the, the line, the, the family tree line going down right. and how significant that was, um, I guess, pointing to how maybe the Nephilims came about. Yeah, or to and, kind of go the other direction of how mm -hmm. when you see later, later, um, giants like Goliath, he's the most well known. Yeah, probably. like, but he right, his right. lineage comes from these guys, so it's very important to trace a genealogy of where you know if you see somebody who has a name that is associated with a giant tribe, then do a little bit of genealogy work, and you'll see that this storyline of the giants actually becomes pretty significant in terms of especially the warfare going on with Moses, Joshua, David. All the way even into the book of Esther where uh, this this guy has it out for the Jews and he wants to see them all dead. And, and uh, well, he's he traces his lineage back to the giants. But unless you know the lineage, unless you know where the, he comes from, then that part of the story doesn't even make any sense to you. <laughs> right. That's true. So in your sermons, do you talk about this stuff a lot? Oh, yeah. So I preach, yeah. the, I preach the books of the Bible. I go verse, verse by verse. And so whenever something like this comes up, 
I'm talking about it. So all, all my <laughs> sermons are online and, and people can listen to anything that I've done and you can read most of them too. Yeah, that's awesome. It must be very interesting. It's fun. Yeah. I always dis get to discover <laughs> new things. <laughs> are you continually learning things? Oh, yeah. Sure. I'm preaching through Luke right now. And um, and uh, the whole section where Jesus, uh, you know, it, it leads up to his death. So it's, Satan wants to enter Judas and and uh, then he has a last supper and then his disciples all forsake him. And that whole thing is just supercharged with supernatural strangeness uh, like what? that people don't even recognize. It's much, much more than just uh, than just Satan entering Judas. Uh, like, for example, I'm, I'm doing Simon of Cyrene. This is the guy that carries the um, crossbar for Jesus when he's on his way to to the to death. It's like, well, why would you mention him? And I came across a guy this week that said, uh, well, he's from a town named Cyrene. And Cyrene had the worship of Zeus. It had one of the biggest temples there to Zeus in the world. And then also uh, he had two sons that were called the twins. And they had a major annual festival there. Well, these twins, uh, somehow there's a connection with the twin idea. So a father and two sons. Well, Simon is told, we're told that he had two sons named Alexander and Rufus. Well, both of those names are associated with Cyrene through Alexander the Great and the historian named Rufus, who told us about him going there and wanting to be called the son of Zeus. So this guy said, well, why would this story be in the Bible? Well, maybe it's because in part, it's not the only reason, but maybe in part, it's because a really clever reader would know that the city of Cyrene was worshiping Zeus and for for this father, who would be a representative of Zeus, to carry the cross is is like he's getting ready to meet his own demise, his own death, which is exactly what happens because Jesus ends up crushing the crushing the serpent. So, like just really weird things like that. You would never think that that story would have anything at all to do with something supernatural with Genesis six, but I think it's quite possible that it does. And there's a whole bunch more of those that that are in that same story so wow is siren is that like a half mermaid or something well that's half a siren man? yeah with okay a, <laughs> this is sirene i think with a c oh. but okay. still yeah yeah sirens are yeah the, sirens are in the bible I, you, you haven't got to the you haven't got to that part of the book yet I can no tell. i haven't oh yeah there that's near you're gonna the make end of me read it <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> You won't tell me about it before I get to it. <laughs> Sirens are um, they're animal uh, angel hybrid is the way I think of them. So a Nephilim is a human angel hybrid and a siren or a centaur or a minotaur, any of those guys, those, those are animal angel hybrids. And those are all viewed as, as demonic creatures by the Old Testament and by the New Testament. Yeah. That's true. Do you believe that people can get possessed today? I do. Yeah. Yeah. There's no reason in my mind why that couldn't happen because uh, I don't think Jesus got rid of demons. I think that he showed his power over them, but he didn't get rid of them. And, uh, you know, we see it in the book of Acts where there's all kinds of demonic possessions that the apostles are going around and exercising those demons. So why would that just suddenly stop at the end of the writing of the New Testament? doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Yeah. Have you ever had to exercise or can you exercise demons out of people? I have never have. Possession? Um, yeah, I've, I've never done that. I've never, it, I mean, the whole idea of it kind of is freaky to me. Um, yeah. So it's not like I go running and looking for it. I guess we'd <laughs> see what would happen if something came my way. But yeah, I believe that Christians do have the power through the blood of Christ to be able to exercise demons. But we should always be careful. You're dealing with ancient, powerful entities that, that uh, can mess with our heads and, and mess with our lives too, if we're not careful. Yeah, exactly. Have you seen anyone possessed? Uh, I think I probably have, but uh, yeah, nobody that I could like, definitively say that, that person's possessed they should go get an exorcism <laughs>
Yeah, that's crazy. Well, I think that's good timing with the 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 reading of Luke because of um, I think nice and fourteen is coming around the corner where that's when Jesus was. Um, I think that's when he did the Last Supper and when he died. So it's I think it's M March. I think, I think yeah. it comes in March this year, March twenty yeah, third or something it, like yeah, that. Very end of March this year. Yep. Yeah. But I did enjoy your book. I haven't gotten through it all. Um, but I really, I just got to the part of the Mount Hermon and the giants um, and the significance of that in our, I don't want to say in our culture today, but it is a significant part of today as being a Christian that we should know this. Yeah. And it's, it's important that we understand this. Yeah, let me tell you kind of the, the main storyline of why I wrote the thing. And this is, you, you get this yeah. when you get to the end of it. But, I mean, to me, the, I mean, it's important. And uh, the giants are interesting and f fun and kind of creepy topic. But there's a much bigger storyline that's going on that involves them. And it starts off with Genesis 3.15. This is where God um, is really cursing the serpent. And he says that there's going to be a war between you and the seed of the woman, between your seed and her seed. And then it says that you're going to bruise his heel, but he's going to crush your head. So what, you know, how does that play itself out in the, in the biblical storyline? So the giants is the physical way that this plays itself out. There's a spiritual way. So Jesus is fighting against, like, for example, the Pharisees, always being confronted by them, and they're the enemy, and he calls them children of the devil. Well, that's a spiritual way that this plays itself out, but the giants are actually the physical offspring of that race of beings to which Satan was was is one of them. And so when you see uh, Moses killing King Og, or when you see giant wars with Abraham, uh, when you see Joshua going in and taking out uh, the sons of Anak, and when you see David killing Goliath, and when you see Esther defeating Haman, and when you see Jesus casting out demons, and you go, well, how is that related? It's because everybody in the old world believed that when a, when it's, when a Nephilim or giant died, because it had a heavenly parent and an earthly parent, it didn't belong to heaven or earth, so it became a spirit that wandered the air in the, in the middle place. And so these become the evil spirits of the New Testament, the unclean spirits. An unclean spirit, a demon in the New Testament, is a disembodied giant. And so when Jesus is casting them out, he's just continuing the war that you find throughout the Old Testament. And the climax of that war is that Jesus dies on the cross. Everybody thinks that it's over, that he's lost the war. Satan thinks he's won. And then, uh-oh, he rises from the dead. And he proves that he is actually the king of kings and that he, all authority in heaven and earth is given to him. Well, this is all because he's obeying and fulfilling this whole uh, war promise that goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. So in other words, the whole giant storyline, I use it to tell people that Jesus is the whole point of this whole thing. This is a story about him. It's a story about his his uh, being God. It's a story about him, him coming as one of us, him defeating the devil, him defeating the demons. He has power over all this. He has the power to save us from hell. He has the power to save us from Satan. He has the power to save us from eternal death. And when we turn to him, he proves that power by coming into us through his, through his Holy Spirit and giving us new life. That's all the giant storyline. I mean, it's a great way to be able to tell people about the master that I serve. Um, by by doing it through a, a storyline that most people don't even realize is really even in the Bible, other than some guy named David kills a guy named Goliath. Like that's about all they know. <laughs> that is um, that's an important part of um, Genesis three fifteen. Um, I think that goes all the way to the very end there, um, proving that um, you know Satan can do and his demons can do what they want, and it's only going to hurt. In the heel in other words it ain't going to affect a lot but the crushing of the head that's that's the demise of of uh, the demons and you know and th there's a really interesting thing i was actually looking at it here this is another one in the story of jesus dying on the cross it says he goes to golgotha 
which means the place of the skull. And so the question becomes, well, what does that mean? So I've been to Israel three times. And when you go as a Protestant evangelical, there's a place called the Garden Tomb. It's outside the city walls, the modern city walls of Jerusalem. It's on the north side. It's just a really beautiful spot where there's a, there, there, it's a beautiful little garden area. And there's a tomb there that gives you an, the idea of what a first century tomb would have looked like. Well, just on the outside of that property, there's a wall of um, limestone, and it looks like a skull. Although about, about nine years ago, the nose of it fell off in a storm, so it doesn't look like a skull so much anymore. But they actually called it, the, they call it like Skull Mountain or something weird like that. So a lot of people think, well, that must be where he was crucified. No, because I don't think the skull, I don't think Golgotha is named after a, a geological feature. I think it's named after a literal skull that was brought to that place and probably buried there. So the question becomes, whose skull? So the church fathers, some of them thought it was Adam's skull. But the thing is, Golgotha, there's a G and an L and a G, Goliath. So there's there, there seems to have been a twisting is, uh, of, of the word for a stone heap and a word for a skull in Hebrew, which is the, all, has these letters G, L, and G going on in it. And Goliath was probably the origin of it. So we read when David kills Goliath, he cuts off his head, and then he takes the head to Jerusalem. And so the question is, well, what did he do with it? Well, it seems like he probably put it on this mountain that then became known as the place of the skull. <laughs> so it's Goliath's head, and Jesus is crucified right there on the place of the skull. So it's, it's, it's like you're seeing a picture of Jesus hanging on the cross with his foot on the head of the serpent itself. So Wow. That's pretty cool. What a twist. What a twist, right? Yeah. Wow. How big is this skull rock? Yeah, I mean, you can't, skull? Even see it. you can't even see it today. Uh, well, you can see a little tiny bit of it in the. You go have to. You have to go into the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which is, I mean, it's a seventeen hundred year old church that's been added on and added on and added on, and there's millions of people go through it every day, and and there's this one little <laughs> section you can go in and kind of look at the what the ground was looked like originally. And to me, I mean, you're from Hawaii. I'm from Colorado. Mountains are a different thing to us than they are to somebody living in Jerusalem. Like they called every little bump on the ground a mountain. <laughs> so it's not that significant of a place <laughs> in terms of its, its geology. It's just that this was the place where David came and he buried the skull and, and the people just remembered it as the, the stone heap and the, and the, and the place where Goliath was, his skull was, buried for whatever reason they did that wow i heard you mentioning um on another podcast about the age of pisces and we're coming to the end of that possibly already oh, yeah. at the end of that yeah and that we may be already in the aquarius age of aquarius yeah. and you were talking something about the degree and every one degree is like 72 years or something like that. yeah 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 so this is something called the great year and the great year you have to imagine the earth is um spinning so you have to you can't be a flat earther for this <laughs> to be around <laughs> earth for this <laughs> and the earth is spinning around and round but it but it it is actually spinning like a top that's a this wobbling and getting ready to fall down so that means that its north axis is actually rotating in a circle and that circle for it to go from point A around the circle back to point A takes about 26,000 years for it to do that one time. So as that happens, you can divide that or essentially into 12 sections mm -hmm. and roughly every 2000 years, you move into another section and roughly speaking, every 72 years, you have one degree of that that you've moved through. So of course, 12. Um, when you're dealing with heavenly things and you have 12, you're thinking Zodiac. 
And so the 12 signs of the Zodiac basically mark out these 12 different divisions of that great circle. And over the course of 26,000 years, the earth goes through one constellation, then the next, then the next, then the next, and then it finally returns back to the beginning. Um, if you look at a Zodiac year, you see that I could get this wrong because I looked at it right. But I think that um, Pisces is the last um, in the month, uh, it's the last month of the, of the Zodiac year. And then the new year starts in Aries, which is, uh, like right about now, actually in a, in an, in a solar year, but the great year actually works backwards. So Aries doesn't come after Pisces Aquarius does. And all that means is that when you go out on a, on a, uh, like, say you go out on, march 21st of any year which is the you know the equinox and you look directly east at sunrise you're going to see the stars rising in the sky and you're going to see that's a constellation and it's one of the 12 constellations which one is it well it depends on when you live so for the last 2000 years that's been pisces at some point in time now it moves slowly right one one degree every 72 years you have no idea really when you're in you know, leaving one and into the other, like, when does that happen? So nobody knows when you're actually out of one age and into the next age, but we do know that we're at the end of the Pisces and we're moving into Aquarius just by going out and scoping out the, the stars on the equinox. So that's what that's referring to. And, you know, uh, the way that the way that uh, the early church seemed to think of it is that Jesus first coming ushered in the age of Pisces, which is why Christians were called little fishes and the baptismal ponds were fish ponds. And, and Jesus said, you're going to make fishers of men, all this stuff. It's a uh, symbol. It's symbols of Pisces, but it's also the last month of the great year. And so when you come into Aquarius, that actually becomes January, whereas Pisces is December. If you'd want to think of it like that. And so you're enter we're entering into the very beginning of this 26,000 year cycle again. And nobody else in human history has been able to say that, at least not recorded human history. So we're in a very interesting, strange time in terms of just the way that the earth is uh has itself located in the in the galaxy and in the heavens and whatever else. And yeah, it could very well be related to satan stuff in terms of him being released uh for a little while and and you know at the end of revelation after the millennium that's kind of my view of that so i think it's very interesting worth thinking about it may explain some of the weirdness that's going on right now in the world with the death cult and people wanting to see humanity extinct from the earth and all this other kind of stuff it's very satanic sorts of ideas um and i don't know yeah, I think, and even um, I think um, the Bible talks about that, about the generation, and by no means will this generation pass um, when the end comes. Maybe he's talking about that generation. I don't know, because I think generation has so many different numbers in the Bible. Some say 33, some say 1,000, some say, you know, different numbers for generations. But I never, when you said that one degree is 72, that was like a generation. I don't know if that has any significance to it, but it just kind of <laughs> <laughs> clicked when you said that. All right. <clears throat> yeah, that's really interesting. Thank you. One more thing I wanted to ask you. Um, I saw an, a, another thing that you wrote in your book you had wrote, and I never saw this before. It was in Job 26.5. You said the Raphaim tremble under the water yeah but then you go on and to another thing that the waters could be the abyss because it's shiel it's like so many rabbit holes <laughs> yeah that no that one is a big rabbit hole because you don't yeah. really know what's going on yeah so you're dealing with the underworld uh okay. a lot of people a lot of people don't understand that our our english word hell you know, we use that word for as an all-encompassing term, whereas the Bible, it's it can actually be partitioned off into several different words. And uh, 
the Greek word, so we, we, there's three Greek words that we translate with one word, hell. So that's not very helpful for us. So the Greek words are Hades and Gehenna and Tartarus. And we translate all those as hell. But the problem is that's not all the same thing. And the Greek word Hades translates in the Old Testament, it translates the word Sheol. So wherever you were, whenever you read the word Sheol or the grave, in Greek that becomes Hades. And in English that becomes hell. So it talks about the Rephaim are in Sheol. They're under the waters of Sheol. And Sheol was depicted as this like subterranean um, city or a country or whatever that's below the earth that's surrounded by all these waters, but it's a dry place. And this is where everybody goes when they die. It didn't matter if you're a believer or not a believer, you go to that place. And then in the New Testament, that becomes Hades. And over time, you get kind of a good side and a bad side. Uh, the, the Greeks had that idea. The late Jews had that idea that, you know, Abraham's bosom. And then you have a side, the other side that they're in torment and fire and whatever else. So that's kind of where we get, we get the fires of Hades from that. But half the place wasn't even that bad of a place. It was a place where, you know, Believers went, and then I think Jesus emptied that out. But the point is that the Rephaim, the point of the Job passage, and I think there's one in Proverbs, maybe one in Isaiah that says the same thing, that the Rephaim are down there. And this is not a place you want to go. This is a place you want to not be around those entities because they're, you know, imagine how bad they are here it, just as demons. So what happens if they have some sort of a an embodied existence down there and like they're generals or they're the prison guards or whatever? This is not the place that you want to be. <laughs> and can humans go there? Well, yeah, everybody, everybody went there when they died. But the thing is, you don't have to go to the place of punishment. If you trust in Christ, then you would, in this is the Old Testament, if you trusted in Christ, then you would go to the good side. And now, uh, after Jesus dies, so the idea is that when he dies, his body dies, but his soul doesn't die. Where does his soul go? It goes somewhere. So where does it go? Well, it descends to Hades because that's where everybody went. But he does not go there as punishment for death or sin because he didn't sin. He goes there as the conquering king. So if you read, if you go read the end of Psalm 24, it talks about how um, there's these gates. Here, I'll read it for you. Pretty well known because it's in the Messiah. Um, lift up your heads, O gates, lift uh, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, lift them up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. So the question is, what gates and doors are those? What's well, the gates of hell? The king is storming the gates of hell. He's demanding that the prisoners that are in there be let out because he's come to conquer them. He's come to conquer the, the enemy. He's going to let the prisoners out. And when he does that, then he takes those people like Abraham and David and, and Ruth and you know name a, name a, a saint from the Old Testament that was down there. He takes them up to heaven. And in the New Testament, believers don't go there anymore. They go to heaven to be with God. Unbelievers go to go there, and that's pretty clear. And so that's a warning from the Old Testament that this is where the Rephaim are, and um, this is not a place you want to be. I, I can't remember what scripture. Maybe it was the Ecclesiastic says that the, de the dead are conscious of nothing. What does that mean? Does that have any significance? Hey, that's a this? tough one. Yeah, that's a tough <clears throat> one. Uh, you know, the Greeks called it Elysium, and it's like the place of forgetfulness, the, the sleepy fields or whatever. So, um, yeah, it, it's a hard one because I think you're dealing with metaphor. And, you know, so it's some metaphors, they're, they're, they don't know anything. But in other metaphors, like it, in the uh, story of L Rich Man and Lazarus, they're like talking to people. So which one is it? Well, if you just let the metaphor be the metaphor, the dead, they can't do anything in this world, can they? Because they're gone. They're, they're somewhere else. They don't have any remembrance of what happened here because they're somewhere else. They don't have any impact here because they're somewhere else. 
doesn't mean they don't have existence. They do, but they're not able to have any memory of, of us because they're too busy with their own things down wherever they're at. Wow. Thank you for that. Well, thank you so much. Um, I don't want to take up any more of your time. I want to be respectful of that. But thank you so much for taking the time out and speaking with me. And I hope you can come back again when I finish reading your book, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> that would be fun. Awesome. And you have a lot of books, don't you? How many books do you have? I think I've written like maybe seven or eight, and then I've added wow. a few more. So. Awesome. And where can people find you and your books? So you can go to douglasvandorn.com and that's my website. And I have kind of all my podcasts there. You can go look those up. I have a whole bunch of stuff on there that hopefully make it fun for people to look up, but I have all my books are linked there. You can see what all the books are. I have a book on giants that we've been talking about, a book on the angel of the Lord and, and uh, some, some more normal topics as well. A book on conspiracy theories. That's not very normal, but I have a book on that. And But you can also just go to Amazon and you can get all, any of the books there. Uh, that's where we publish our books through is Amazon. And then uh, anybody who wants to get in, you know, read my sermons or hear the sermons. So go to my church's website, which is rbcnc.com. And then all those sermons are just there for free and you can just look into them uh, you can listen to them and most of them have PDFs that you can read and, and, uh, read along with the sermon and whatever. So those are all just there for people to take. Wow. Thank you. And there's a, there's and 22 I'm... years worth of, of stuff there. <laughs> like there's a lot of material there. So, yeah. I know I was looking through <laughs> it and I didn't know which rabbit hole to go down. <laughs> right. <laughs> I figured, let me just stick with the book then. But, um, I want to finish your book and if I can have you back on, that would be amazing. Yeah, that would be fun. What what would the next book should I read after this one? Which one should I read? Well, it depends on what you want to go down. Uh, no, which Angel rabbit hole? The, the, yeah, the Angel of the Lord is probably the second biggest seller that okay. I have, and right. and that one really is talking about Christ in the Old Testament and where that came from. You asked the giant book that this one came from the same place. So Michael Heiser has two or three chapters on the Angel of the Lord in his Unseen Realm. But I thought, well, there's a there's a whole book that can be written on that. So me and another pastor decided we, we would write that book. Wow. OK, I'm going to hit that one after this one. <laughs>And that brings us to an end of another episode of the Sensible Hippie podcast. I'd like to thank my guest, Doug Van Dorn, for joining us today and sharing his fascinating insights. Doug's exploration of biblical narratives and his interpretation of ancient texts have certainly given us a lot to ponder. And to my listeners, thank you for tuning in. If you've enjoyed today's episode, please take a moment to give us a rating and review on your favorite podcast platform. Your support helps us to grow and it continues to bring enlightening conversations to you and help others to find this podcast. So until the next time, keep exploring the depths of history and spirituality. And remember, every ancient text opens a door to new wisdom. So until the next time, keep exploring, keep questioning, and keep thinking outside the box. Bye! cherry on top of your broken dreams i didn't ask you for anything but you're acting like i did i can feel it when you walk around you see a light try to put it out do i remind you that you never found exactly what you need cycles repeat
Peace.